Hello and welcome to worship for September 27th here at First Presbyterian Church in Newton, worshiping together apart. Thank you for being here. Um, this, uh, this morning we are starting something new. We, we are having a worship leader um, and we are delighted to have Marilyn uh, joining us this morning. Uh, if you are interested, we uh, need more people to help out. So if you are interested in being a reader and or a song leader, please let me know. Uh, we'd be happy to incorporate you in future worship services. Just a reminder that uh, if you are watching this uh, worship service before or at 1030 on Sunday morning, that there is an opportunity to join for fellowship via Zoom afterwards, immediately afterwards around 1130. And uh, it's a great way to connect with one another and we hope that you will join us. If you uh, are not aware of how to do that, please contact me or the church office and we will uh, help, help get you on Zoom. Uh, let us worship God. If you feel comfortable doing so, please stand and join me in the call to worship. We have come together to praise God from whom all blessings flow. The, the firmament, the, the covering of the earth, earth and seas is, is the roof of our sanctuary. And so, we dwell in the house of God all the days of our lives as one people. We will sing songs of praise and give thanks for God's steadfast hope in us. Who today will bless God for God's surpassing greatness. Let everything that breathes worship and praise God. Let us worship God.
recognize our humanity and pray for peace over our brokenness. Together, let us pray the prayer of confession. Jesus, Jesus we, we ask that you take, take these prayers to the, to the heart of God. God. We, we know, know the ways in which, which sin, sin separates us from God. God. We, we confess our reluctance to claim the sin in our lives. Today, may we move past the prideful notions of our piety and look closer at what we don't do. For sometimes the greatest sin of all is our own complicity with what is wrong in the world. We want to love as you command, Jesus. But too often catch ourselves justifying the injustice of hunger, poverty, war, and all the prejudices we didn't know we had. Forgive us so, so that we may catch ourselves righting our wrongs. Forgive us so that the lessons we learn at the Spirit's nudging may help bring the peace and love you seek in our families, in the church, and the world. Help us to be more holy in our hearts. Amen.
coming out to you, uh, to let me imagine I'm speaking with you. Imagine you're here with me. Uh, I do miss you and look forward to seeing you in real life someday soon. But until that time, we continue this way, and it works out just fine, doesn't it? So today, um, we're going to hear a scripture in worship where Jesus tells another one of the stories. You know, Jesus was always telling stories. And one of these, and the story that we're going to hear today is uh, a story about a father asked his sons to go out and work in the vineyard, in the garden. And the first son said, no, I'm not going to go. And the second son said, okay, I will. But it was actually the first son who said he wouldn't go, but then he did, who, who did actually go work. And the other son who said he would go, did not go work. So Jesus said, who do you think did the father's will? And of course, the answer is the one who said he wasn't going to go, but he eventually did. And this was some... Um, uh, part of what Jesus was talking about, was trying to teach people about, is that our actions are, um, sometimes our, act our words are really, really important, but our actions are also really important. So if we say we're going to do something, um, something we're supposed to do, we need to do it. And if maybe sometimes we're a little naughty and say we're not going to do something we're supposed to do, but we actually do, that's good too. So, what I'm trying to say is that it's important that we do what, what God wants us to do. That's what's really important. And let's, you know what, I, I realize that sometimes, um, not sometimes, I never pray with you guys. And I should pray with you guys. And I'm going to say that, and I'm going to do it. So let's pray right now. Dear God, we are so grateful for our young worshipers among us. We pray that you would be with them and uh, help them to, to follow you, to do your will, to do good things, um, and to say good things as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming up. The first scripture reading today is Matthew chapter 21 verses 23 to 32. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was preaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all, of, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. 
The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. concerning the land of Israel. The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. Because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed, they shall surely live. They shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says the way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repeat and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that have committed you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? 
for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. Friends, this too is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, settle our hearts and minds as we meditate upon the scriptures today. Help us to hear them in a new way. May they prompt us to action acceptable to God. May the peace of Christ be with us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. The way of the Lord is unfair. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. Is there more grace or punishment in this passage? Well, let's just count, shall we? Let's see how many times punishment appears and how many times grace appears throughout the passage as it comes up in this sermon. So Ezekiel was both prophet and priest to the house of Israel during the Babylonian exile. In addition to denouncing their sin, iniquity, and good old-fashioned wickedness among the themes of Ezekiel's messages to the people, was assurance of God's abiding presence among them. In other words, grace. And this passage is essentially an argument between God and the exiles. The exiles claim that God is unfair, that God, and they blame their ancestors for all of their problems. And it's not without good reason. After all, it was their ancestors' untruthfulness to God, unfaithfulness to God, that landed them in exile in the first place. And apparently the exiles liked to quote a proverb to support this claim. So while we don't actually find this proverb in the Hebrew scriptures, it does have scriptural foundation in passages such as Exodus 20, verse 5, which states, you shall not bow down to idols or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the inequity of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. So that sounds pretty punishing. However, the passage then continues, but showing steadfast love to the thousands generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. So even in a text that seems to affirm this idea that children will pay for their parents' sins, God promises to punish three and four generations, but God also promises to punish for a thousand, I mean to bless for a thousand generations. So today's passage begins with this proverb, and Ezekiel says, The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. When I hear a sour grapes, I can't help but think of Esau's fable. Remember how that went? Driven by hunger, a fox tried to reach some grapes hanging high on a vine, but was unable to, although he leaped with all his strength. And as he went away, the fox remarked, Oh, you aren't even ripe yet. I don't need any sour grapes. People who speak despairingly of things they cannot attain would do well to apply this story to themselves, Esau says. Okay, so Esau's fable isn't about the same thing at all. 
or is it? Not at first glance, certainly, but maybe when we dig a little deeper. The fable is about people who don't get what they want, then denouncing that thing as no good. They didn't really want it after all. And in this story, through Ezekiel, God speaks out against a proverb that claims that the sins of the fathers, i.e. sour grapes, are visited upon the sons, i.e. teeth set on edge. The children will pay for the sins of the parents. But God discredits this proverb. The children of the house of Israel had been using the previous generation's shortcomings to excuse their own failings, similar to the fox claiming that the grapes are no good, to excuse his inability to get them. Sour grapes. It seems to be human nature to try to blame other people or circumstances beyond our control for our own mistakes or sins. Logan was a toddler. Logan's mother discovered him and the family dog in the bathroom. Logan's back was turned to the door and he did not realize that his mother was watching him as he swatted the toilet paper roll over and over, toilet paper cascading onto a pile on the floor. And when his mother called out, Logan, he turned to her and immediately pointed to the innocent bystander and said, Dog! The toddler, barely able to speak, had already learned to blame someone else. In this case, the dog. So think of a time when you may have blamed someone else for something that was actually your fault. How many times have you said, I never even would have been in that situation to make that mistake if someone hadn't done what they did. I'm afraid I have to admit I have done this many times. The scripture then continues. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. Point grace. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. Grace. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Let's just call that one a draw. All lives are mine. I love this. God claims us all as belonging to God. In our culture, and probably in most cultures throughout human history, there's a sense that children belong to their parents. Probably not so much now as there was in the past, but it's still there. But humans do not belong to other humans, regardless of age, or at least they shouldn't. Humans, regardless of age, belong to God. And it's an important distinction. When we see children as belonging to God instead of us, we realize that we are only stewards, guardians of their lives. They are not ours to do with or treat as we please. We care for them on behalf of God, to whom they belong, until they are able to care for themselves on behalf of God. We care for ourselves on behalf of God as well. We too are guardians and stewards of our own lives on behalf of God to whom we belong. So we best treat ourselves, our lives, and each other appropriately. God declares that if it is wrong for the children, that it is wrong for the children to suffer for the sins of the parents. Pretty fair. And we may, and that may be how it works in the world where babies are sometimes born with birth defects and addictions due to their parents' chemical addictions. 
where generations are saddled with political systems of their ancestors, which they do not want and did not choose, where children can be impacted by choices of their parents long beyond their childhood, and of course, the environmental crisis in which we now find ourselves is an example of that. The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Unfortunately, it can be the way of the world for children to suffer for the sins of their parents. But it is not God's way. God holds each one accountable for their own sins. Neither the righteousness nor the sinfulness of the parents is transferred to the following generation. Each life belongs to God. And the scripture continues with God saying, Yet you say that the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When, does the, righteous, when the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. So, point punishment for the iniquity that they have committed they shall die point punishment ah fairness so many of our scriptures recently have been about fairness and here it is again the people say that god is unfair and it seems to me in a way that unfair is a way of saying sour grapes a way to blame someone else, someone outside yourself, for the circumstances in which you find yourself. A common reaction when things go badly is to think, God is unfair. I am being treated unfairly. I have no control over this situation. God is unfair. But life's unfairness is unrelated to God's unfairness. Yes life is not fair, but God's unfairness is one of grace. So God is calling the righteous out for turning away from their righteousness and specifically names their sin is as iniquity, that is unfairness, evil, gross injustice. The word itself connects wickedness, immorality, and inequality. When the righteous support inequality, promote inequality, benefit from inequality, it is they who are unfair, not God, and it is they who will pay for it. And the scripture continues again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life grace. Because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed, they shall surely live. Grace. They shall not die. Grace. When the wicked turn away from their ways, they will be saved. No situation is so bad that it cannot be solved by the grace of God. How great is that? And if you remember, this is what Jesus was talking about in the Gospel Maryland just read. Between two sons, the righteous son who says he will work in the field, but does not, and the wicked son who says he won't go to work in the field, but ultimately does, it is the seemingly, seemingly wicked son who does the will of God. And God says, Yet the house of Israel says the way of the Lord is unfair. O oh, house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore I will judge you, O oh, house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Point punishment. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Punishment. God is calling all the people to account for claiming God is unfair. But God says, 
I'm fair. I judge you according to your actions, according to the way you treat your neighbor. You're the ones who are unfair. It's your system that's broken, not mine. Repent, now's your chance. Change your ways, abandon iniquity, or iniquity will be your downfall. Turn away, simply turn away from the ways that are not of God and turn to God. God continues to persuade, saying, cast away from all the transgressions that you have committed against me and get yourselves a new heart, point grace and a new spirit, grace. You, why will you die, O house of Israel? Punishment. I love this idea that in turning from sin to God, we get a whole new heart. Even if, metaphorically speaking, of course, you inherited heart disease from your parents, there is always the opportunity to get a new heart in a new spirit and it's not a once and done thing every time we turn from our brokenness and sin we get a new heart and a new spirit unfortunately no one i've ever met was perfect maybe you know someone who is we all fall short we all turn to sin but we all have the opportunity to turn back to god and get a new heart transplant, so to speak. And here's how our passage concludes. For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Grace, turn then and live. Grace, no pleasure. God has no pleasure, this is so important. We tend to think of God found in the Hebrew scriptures as a vengeful, violent, almost egomaniac who likes to smite people for offenses that oftentimes we consider trivial. But here we see God, we see God saying, I don't want to do this. This hurts me more than it hurts you. God says, please, just get your act together. Turn to me and turn away from sin so we don't have to go through this. But the question then arises, what is meant by life and death? We know that many really mean, really mean, unkind, greedy, even people we may consider evil can have really nice, long lives, and on the other hand, wonderful, kind, caring, generous people die young. That's not fair. Indeed, Jesus was killed for his own righteousness at a young age, and sometimes it's tempting to think it might be nice if God would instantly smite bad people, or people we consider bad. Except that when we consider that sometimes we ourselves leave much to be desired, and maybe on a bad day we too would be, end up being on the receiving end of a good smiting, maybe we don't want God to be quite that fair. So what if we're not talking about literal life and death? What is meant by life and death here? Sin equals that which separates us from God, equals death. On the other hand, turning away from sin and towards God equals life. So what's the count now? Maybe some of you were keeping count of grace and punishment. Was there more grace or punishment in this passage? It's human tendency to focus on the punishment rather than the grace. But according to my count, grace racked up nine points while punishment only got five. There's also a tendency, a human tendency, or at least an American tendency, to focus on unfairness when we perceive ourselves or someone we care about to be on the wrong side but not so much when we get the long end of the stick. I've probably mentioned this before, but 
My, my favorite example is when my sister and I were kids, it seemed like there was always a big row when the ice cream was dished. One of us, or maybe even both of us, would look at the other one's bowl and shout, she got more than me, obviously. In our minds, this perceived slight meant that our parents loved our sister more than they loved us. We never looked at the bowls and complained, I got more than her. So let's just all let go of this self-justifying. Let go of blame, let go of the proverb. It's a great paradox, but it is in accepting responsibility for our own guilt that makes it possible to let it go. In confessing our sin, our sin is relieved. So friends, let us cast away from all the transgressions that we have committed against God and against one another. Let us get ourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Turn then and live. Granted, being broken, sinful people, we have to turn repeatedly. We are all constantly in need of grace. The good news is that God takes no pleasure in punishing us. God desires us to turn then and live. God desires that all our brothers and sisters throughout the world might live. So may we look for ways to partner with God in partnering with our brothers and sisters throughout the world that all might live. Amen. Christ reconciled us to God so that we might be one new humanity. Through this reconciliation comes the promise of peace. Though we're not together in person to pass the offering plate down the pew, we still we are called to give back a portion of the gifts God has provided. Let us take this time to consider our commitments through our tithes and offerings, time and talents, to support the ministry of our church family, our community, and beyond. Let us give with an open heart to share Christ's reconciliation throughout the world.
most loving and gracious God, we offer these gifts to you to do your work. May they help us to discern the ways in which you would have us break down the dividing walls and boundaries in our world as we seek to erase hostilities and bring peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, we come to the time in our worship service where we uh, raise joys and concerns. And uh, after each prayer request, I will say either God in your mercy or God in your grace. And we will together lift them to God, saying, hear our prayer. As always, additional prayer requests uh, can be shared during Zoom fellowship following worship. Or at any time during the week, you can contact me directly. I'd like to start with prayers um, for Louisville, Kentucky, and for our whole, our whole country as we continue to struggle with, uh, with race-related uh, strife. God, help those of us who do not understand to understand, and help us heal the brokenness. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we pray uh, for the many people in our country, in our world, who are suffering from natural disasters. Whether it's uh, the derecho that we suffered, or hurricanes, tropical storms, or fires, or some other natural disaster. We pray for safety and for um, recovery. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for safety this harvest season for all of those involved in the harvest, dealing with many big, uh, dangerous uh, machines. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray always for teachers and parents and students as they continue uh, this school year in such an unusual, strange, novel time. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. We pray for all who are suffering from illness, whether physical or mental. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we pray for all suffering from a coronavirus, from the many different aspects, whether directly suffering with illness or having lost a loved one or having lost a job or income or having lost fellowship with others and feeling isolated. Uh, all of us are impacted in one way or another, and we pray uh, for all in this time. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Our prayers for uh, the Presbytery this week, the week of September 27th, are for Community United Presbyterian Church of Hartford and their pastor, Reverend Kristen Spike, and for First Presbyterian Church of Lucas. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray, as always, for peace in South Sudan, for, our, for unity in our divided country, and for healing in our broken world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let us continue in prayer. Through God's steadfast compassion for us, God has filled us with concern for our world. Therefore, we pray for what we need, saying, God of compassion, hear our prayer. God, you have placed a desire for truth and righteousness in all of the hearts of all people. Uplift those who seek to live faithfully and lovingly by promptings of your spirit. Even those who do not know your name, save them from despair and lead them to the fullness of salvation. For seekers of truth, God of compassion, hear our prayer. God, you call the children of Israel to make known your righteousness. And you call disciples of Jesus to make the good to take the good news of your salvation to all nations. Help those who know your name to be faithful in their calling, 
to live according to your commandments and to testify to your abounding love for all who believe in you, God of compassion, hear our prayer. God, you have formed your people into communities of prayer and service. Strengthen the leaders of your church. Give them all humble and obedient hearts for the after the example of Christ, who humbled himself in obedience to you. For ministers of the gospel, God of compassion, hear our prayer. God, you have placed in human hearts a hunger to understand the structures and rhythms of creation. Grant wisdom to those who seek to comprehend the inner workings of the world. Save them from arrogance and enable them to work for the flourishing of humankind. For scientists, God of compassion, hear our prayer. God, you fill the world with forms that delight the ear and eye. Give artists and musicians a vision of your transcendent beauty and grant them skill to render their vision in tangible works that manifest the sublime glory of your creation. For artists, God of compassion, hear our prayer. God, you established the nations of the world to order humanity, human community, Kindle love for peace among the nations and their leaders. Save them from pride of wealth or power and enable them to serve the common good. For all those who govern, God of compassion, hear our prayer. God, you provided the earth as a garden and you commanded the human community to till the land that it may be fruitful. Bless those called to the work of agriculture. Give those who benefit from farming thankful hearts for this good work. Help farmers to respect our common resources and to resist careless exploitation of nature for temporary gain. For those who farm the land, God of compassion, hear our prayer. God, you hear the cry of all who are in distress. Heal those who are sick in mind, body, or spirit. Comfort them in their need and help those who care for them. Teach us to bear the burdens of our sisters and brothers with humility. For the sick and those in distress, God of compassion, Hear our prayer. These prayers we offer through Christ by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, please stand as you feel led to do, if you feel led to do so to join in singing Come Labor On.
stay home in peace, remembering that we are judged only for how we treat one another. It is not God that is unjust, it is us who are unjust. So turn from your unjust ways, turn toward God, love God, serve God. Friends, stay home in peace, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.